A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 5 from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms textbook. This chapter deals with microbial growth and its control. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, when bacteria grow, this means an increase in cell number. So one cell divides into two, those two divide into four, and so on and so forth. The process by which cells divide is called binary fission. It is an asexual form of uh, cell division. And then following cell division, you have an enlargement of cell size to about twice its minimum size. During binary fission, uh, remember first you replicate the circularized chromosome, and then a septum forms. The septum is the partition behind dividing cells, which pinches off between two daughter cells. We're also going to discuss the generation time. This is the time required for microbial cells to double in number. Uh, this can vary between different types of cells. We'll touch on this as well. So here's binary fission uh, simplified. You have a bacillus bacterium. The bacteria will elongate and then a septum will form. And once the septum forms, that will complete and you result in two uh, daughter cells. And what's going on with the chromosome during binary fission? Remember, uh, prokaryotes have one circularized chromosome. The chromosome begins to divide, or re get replicated, I should say. Uh, the DNA is replicated. Now you have two copies of the circularized chromosome. Those migrate to opposite poles of the cell. Then septum, begin septum formation begins. Septum forms, and then you have your two cells. Now, how does the DNA replicate? Re recall that DNA, <clears throat> you have a one bacterial chromosome that's circularized, and there's one point where DNA replication begins, and only one point called the origin of replication, or ORI. This replication continues until the terminus site, where that's the site at which replication is terminated. Now take a look here. Here's, here's the system of uh, how the chromosome is replicated in a prokaryotic cell. Remember, you have one circularized chromosome. At one point, you have the origin of replication. DNA replication begins at that point where the double-strand DNA is separated and then you have DNA replication proceeding in both directions. And once, the, once those, uh, those uh, the DNA replication machinery bump into the terminus, which is the other end of the circularized chromosome, then you have two uh, daughter uh, DNA complete genomes. Those uh, chromosomes separate to opposite poles of the cell you have septum formation and cell division. There you go, you've completed cell division. And remember, this is binary fission. This is a form of asexual cell division. Now let's take a closer look at septum formation. During septum formation, you have various steps. First, you have to select the site for septum formation, then assemble what's known as the Z ring, then link the Z-ring to the plasma membrane, then assemble cell wall synthesize, synthesizing machinery, and finally construct, uh, constrict the cell and uh, proceed with septum formation. So I'm gonna show you step by step what is entailed here. So first of all, <clears throat> remember that you need to pick the site of septum formation. And the FITS proteins, which stands for uh, the filamentous temperature sensitive proteins, these FITS proteins play a big role in septum formation, where the septum forms. So these are proteins 
uh, that interact to form the divisome or the cell division apparatus. You've got FITZ proteins that form the FITZ ring, what's called the FITZ ring. This FITZ ring determines the site of septum formation. And then you have the ZIP A and FITZ A proteins, which help to connect the Z ring to the cell membrane. So here you can see these FITZ Z proteins. These are the FITZ Z proteins. They they uh, come together and form a multimer of FITZ Z proteins in a ring. And that ring is going to direct where the septum will form. Once the FITZ Z protein is in place, You've got your FITZ A and ZIP A proteins that will anchor it to the plasma membrane. And then you have the rest of these proteins. You see FITZ Q, FITZ L, FITZ B. These are all part of the divisome, which also come in to play a role in septum formation. So how does the FITZ Z ring know where to form? The FITZ Z ring knows where to form based on the location of the min proteins. The min proteins will oscillate back and forth. And by the way, these min proteins include min C, min D, and min E. See, these min C, D, E complex oscillate back and forth, kind of like the front of, uh, if, if you recall the old 80s TV show, Knight Rider, on the front of the kit car, you saw this little beam, this light beam that goes back and forth. Min C D E complex also pulses back and forth, or oscillates back and forth. And based on this oscillation, the fit Z ring knows where to locate to at the center of the cell. This is really neat. They have tagged here min D with a, a fluorescent protein. And you could see a uh, time course at zero seconds, the min C D E complex is at the right side of the cell. At 15 seconds, it's oscillated to the left side of the cell. At 30 seconds, it is oscillated back to the right side of the cell. So if you were to watch this in real time, you would see the min C D E proteins oscillating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that oscillation directs uh, the fit Z ring formation and the divisome complex formation as well. This directs septum or promotes septum formation. Then you have septum formation down the middle. Isn't that neat? Now, what about the uh, DNA? Once you copy the DNA, the DNA needs to move to opposite poles of the cell, right? Well, it's the MREB proteins that play a major role in separation of the chromosomes after DNA replication. Also, the MREB plays a major role in the, in the um, uh, cell wall formation as well. So how does it work? The MREB forms a spiral-shaped band around the inside of the cell just underneath the plasma membrane. And MREB localizes synthesis of new peptidoglycan and other cell wall components to specific locations. And it's involved, like I said, in chromosome segregation. So the fact that the two new chromosomes separate to opposite poles of the cell. So here's an image showing you this uh, MREB uh, quaternary complex. You've got all these different proteins the MREB proteins forming a spiral around the inside of the cell just beneath the plasma membrane. And you can see here again the MREB in purple around the inside of the cell. You see where these spots, you see these spots here uh, where the MREB touches the plasma membrane, this red dotted line. This, these are sites of new cell wall synthesis. Additionally, DNA molecules, like I said, the, the DNA strands after DNA replication, they will follow these rails. They will follow this track to move to opposite poles of the cell. Now, um, there are some bacteria that have a comma shape. These are called Vibrio bacteria. 
And the reason for the Vibrio shape is a protein called crescentin. Crescentin uh, localizes on the concave face of curved cells. So that's an interesting fact to know. Now, during budding division, this is different than binary fission. This is budding division where you form unequal cell growth uh, and not directly down the center. You will see these in bacteria that form stalks or hyphae and have appendages. Now take a look at this. Uh, when new cell wall material is formed, peptidoglycan is formed in coccus shaped bacterium, you'll have new uh, bacterial uh, peptidoglycan synthesis right here at the hemisphere, at the, at the center of the cell. And you can see that uh, the peptidoglycan will grow inwards kind of in, during the septum formation and you will end up with new growth on one hemisphere of each daughter cell. On rod-shaped cells, you will see different patterns emerge. You will have sidewall elongation, where you have a patchy uh, nascent growth. You can have uh, pep peptidoglycan growing at one pole of the cell. Uh, down the center so that so that the daughter cells have new peptidoglycan strictly at the pole so that's a little bit different than patchy now um, <clears throat> how is peptidoglycan synthesized how is peptidoglycan synthesized Pre-existing peptidoglycan needs to be severed to allow newly synthesized peptidoglycan to form. Uh, so you, what you need to do is lyse or break apart the already existing cell wall if you want to add to it, if you want to if you want to expand the cell wall and grow the cell, or if you want to divide during septum formation. So it's these auto license. It's these auto lysins that break apart the the um, the peptidoglycan in order to introduce new uh, subunits. Remember these NAG NAM uh, subunits, these peptidoglycan precursors, and it's Bactoprenol's role. This is a carrier mo molecule. Bactoprenol will bring peptidoglycan to the site of insertion from inside of the cell. And it's glycosylases that will interact with bacto bactoprenol. These will insert uh, the cell wall precursors into the growing points of the cell wall and catalyze glycosidic bond formation. So take a look here. You have the auto license Autolysins will break the existing cell wall. Uh, Autolysins break the existing cell wall. You have bactoprenol bringing new, new uh, cell wall components to the site of insertion. And then you have transglycosylase activity. This glycosylase activity will then insert this new building block uh, into place. This is how cell wall material is made. This is how peptidoglycan is lengthened. And, the pro and then after that, remember there's a process of transpeptidation. This is the final st step where it's these short peptide uh, bonds, uh, or sorry, these short peptides which extend out from the peptidoglycan helices. They have to be uh, they have to be transpeptidation. They have to undergo transpeptidation. Remember, you're linking uh, DAP to D-alanine. Uh, you're linking D DAP to D-alanine. Here it's a direct linkage, so you can tell it's a gram-negative uh, interaction, a gram-negative uh, uh, peptide bond formation. Again, just to review, if you if binary fission happens down the, if, if cell division happens down the center of the cell, this is binary fission. 
but you can also end up with unequal products of cell division such as budding, budding to form hyphae, cell division from stocked organisms, or polar growth without differentiation. These are all examples of unequal cell division. Now, uh, more about how bacterium grow. We're moving on to biofilm formation. Planktonic growth is growth as a suspension. So if the bacteria are floating around in solution, this would be a form of planktonic growth. Sessile growth, on the other hand, is growth attached to surfaces, which can sometimes form biofilms. What are biofilms? Biofilms are, uh, are bacterium that form a sticky matrix and form communities. Microbial mats are a little bit different. These are multi-layered sheets with uh, different organisms in each layer. So here you can see a microbial mat versus a biofilm. So you have a biofilm on top. This is a sticky, sugary uh, matrix. And then you have the mats at the bottom here. So biofilms can be a health hazard. Uh, biofilms prevent harmful chemicals such as antibiotics from penetrating uh, <clears throat> and, de and destroying the bacterial cells. They can do, they can prevent washing away of cells. Uh, they can uh, also affect our water distribution systems, fuel storage, etc. So biofilms are a big issue in the healthcare setting. You can form biofilms on medical devices. You can form biofilms in catheters. And how do bacteria grow? Remember, bacteria undergo asexual reproduction, so um, it doesn't take much time for a bacterial cell to double. Uh, for example, E. coli will double once every approximately 20 minutes. And uh, that bacterial growth, as long as there's nutrients around, is going to be logarithmic. So one bacteria divides into two, two divides into four, four into eight, so on and so forth. This is a logarithmic growth. And the relationship between the initial number of cells present in a culture and the number present after a period of exponential growth, this is the equation here where N, capital N, is the final cell number. N naught is the initial cell number, and lowercase n is the number of generations during the period of exponential growth. So take a look here. Um, this is kind of the, the concept. At time zero, the number of divisions would be zero. So the equation would be two to the power of zero equals one, so you would have one cell. Because at time zero, you have one cell. But at time 20 minutes, this is the uh, doubling time for let's say E. coli. At time 20 you have one cellular division so you have 2 to the n, 2 to the 1 number of cells, you have 2 cells. At time 40 you have 2 divisions so you have 2 to the 2 uh, cells which means you have 4 cells. And you can see that this number doubles every 20 minutes and this is why after several days you have millions of bacterium on your plates. Okay, again, this is a logarithmic growth of bacterium. Logarithmic growth of bacterium. Now, let's talk about bacterial growth in a batch culture. A batch culture means a closed system microbial culture of fixed volume. So imagine if I were to put some bacteria inside of a flask or something like a uh, you know like a like a one liter flask of TSB broth that would be an example of a closed system of microbial culture of fixed volume what would happen in a flask if I were to add some bacteria to the flask well the first thing that would happen is a period of lag followed by exponential growth followed by a stationary phase and death so let me show you that plotted out here Again, we have time plotted on the x-axis and log of viable organisms, log 10 of viable organisms on the y-axis. Let's say I have my one liter flask and at time zero, I introduce some cells. I introduce some cells to my flask. There's going to be, a, a, there's gonna be some 
uh, a, a period of lag, a period of lag where the bacterium are not growing, but once the bacterium are uh, adapted, they're they're used to the to the environment. They're going to start growing in an exponential fashion. Okay, exponential growth, and then at some point they're going to expand all of the resources. All of the nutrients are gonna be used up, there's waste floating around, and this will uh, trigger a stationary phase where the bacterium are no longer growing. And eventually, some of those bacteria will die. Some of the bacteria will die off, and this is called the death or senescence phase. And the reason for the death or senescence phase, well, uh, you know, there's no nutrients around uh, there's a lot of waste in the in the fixed batch culture, and uh, this marks a death phase. All right, moving on to culturing microbes and measuring their growth. So this this has a lot to do with what you're learning in the lab. You remember, culture media is a nutrient solution used to grow microbes in the lab. You have to typically you sterilize this culture media in the autoclave to sterilize it. There are two broad classes of culture media to know about, defined media and complex media. Defined media, you know the exact chemical composition of what's in that media. Whereas complex media, you don't know exactly what's in there, but it's usually, usually some kind of uh, digests of microbial animal or plant products for example a yeast extract or a meat extract so you know it's nutritious you don't know exactly the concentrations of nutrients inside enriched media uh, contains complex media plus highly nutritious materials such as serum or blood so why would you have an enriched media well sometimes you might have uh, a fastidious culture which means nutritionally demanding microbes. These microbes may not grow well without some kind of enrichment. So you would want to uh, you know, use enrichment media for such bacteria, for such fastidious bacteria. Selective media, this is media that contains some kind of compound that inhibits the growth of some microbes, but not others. For example, you could inhibit the growth of gram negatives, but not gram positives. You could inhibit the growth of uh, non-halophiles and only promote the growth of halophiles. So you're, you're inhibiting some bacterium from growing. Whereas differential media, you're not inhibiting growth, but instead you have some kind of indicator mixed in with the media, usually a dye, that can detect a particular metabolic reaction during growth. So you can tell well, these bacterium, for example, metabolize mannitol, whereas these bacterium, for example, don't. All right, so when you, sell, when you grow your bacterium in liquid or solid media, remember that the solid media is solid because of the addition of agar. Agar is a cell wall component from, uh, from seaweed, and the cell wall component looks like powder Remember in the lab, we mixed it in with our TSB and it solidified after autoclaving into this solid agar on the Petri dish. And when you do have these solid agar Petri dishes, these TSA plates, if you do a proper streak technique, you will find individual colonies of bacterium. And each one of these colonies consists of a clonal population. That means uh, all have the same uh, genetics because uh, uh, they all arose from exponential growth uh, in an asexual fashion. So they're all clones of one another. These this colonies are millions of bacteriums that are all clones of one another. All right. Now, remember that microbes are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. And this is why we must sterilize media uh, and by sterilize, you, usually we utilize a autoclave. And to prevent contamination during culture techniques, we employ aseptic technique. You guys remember aseptic technique from the lab, hopefully. We flame our loop. We remove the cap with a pinky without p placing it down. We flame the tip of the, of the test tube. We then... Uh, introduce our sterilized loop into the tube 
We then flame the tube again. We close the cap and then we go ahead and place our bacterium uh, onto the plate. Remember, working around the flame is part of proper aseptic technique. And the reason we do streak plates is to find these isolated colonies. Now, how do we count bacterium? Okay, there's two ways of counting bacteria there's, uh, that I want you to know about anyway. There's viable plate counting and then there's the tubidometric uh, way of counting bacterial cells as well. So let's look at viable plate counts. Viable plate counts. You could form a spread plate or a pore plate. Either way, it's a very similar procedure. You're looking for the countable plate. Countable plates have between 30 and 300 colonies. So let me show you uh, the difference between a spread plate and a pour plate first. A spread plate, you're adding bacterium to a plate and then using a hockey stick to spread the bacteria around and later on you will count the surface colonies. On a pour plate, you have an empty petri dish. This is not an agar plate. This is just an empty petri dish. You're adding the bacterium to the petri dish. Then you add your liquid agar, molten agar, on top and after you incubate, you will find bacterium both on the surface of the pore and embedded inside of the agar as well. So that's the main difference between a spread plate and a pore plate. Either way, you can use these plates to count colonies. And how do we conduct these plate count uh, assays? Well, you would take your sample to be counted and remember what you're trying to find are cells per mil of original sample. So we're, what we're going to do first is make a serial dilution. So we're taking one ml of our sample to be counted, placing it in nine ml of broth, then mixing and placing one ml of that into nine ml of broth, mixing and doing it again, mixing, doing it again, again and again. So this is your one in 10 dilution. This is your one in 100, one in 1000, one in 10,000, etc., etc. And then, and then what you do is you take some aliquot of this broth uh, and you're gonna plate it out. So here you're plating out one ml of this broth. You're plating out one ml of this broth, this broth, this broth, this broth, this broth. And then you incubate your plates after spreading, right? Uh, you can make a spread plate or a pour plate. Then you incubate these plates. Then after incubation, you would look at the plates and determine which plate is the countable plate. And remember, the countable plate is the plate between 30 and 300 colonies. So this plate obviously is too many to count. This plate is, is too many to count. This plate has roughly 150 colonies. So you would keep this plate. You would also throw away these plates. So the only plate you would collect is this plate here. Uh, and you would count the colonies. After you count the colonies, you see you have 159 colonies and there you go you have your 159 colonies the dilution factor that led to this plate was your 10 to the 3 uh, 10 to the minus 3 um, dilution when you solve for you know bring it out of the denominator you have 1.59 times 10 to the 5 cells per milliliter so there you go you've now counted uh, the bacteria and, and that's how many bacterium you have. You have 1.59 times 10 to the 5 cells in your original in your original batch uh, per, per ml. Okay, so sources of error that you could potentially have in plate counting, uh, it, you could uh, have a variable inoculum size, um, you could have, uh, you, oh, if you have mixed cultures, they could grow at different rates. You could have plating inconsistencies. Um, and also, one thing you should know is that you're only counting viable uh, cells. You're only counting cells that are alive. If they're not alive, they won't grow to form a colony. Also, think about it. If you have a bacteria that's fastidious, uh, and requires some kind of enriched culture, you're not going to get growth of that bacterium either. Okay. Now let's talk about a different way of counting bacterium. This is called the turbidometric measurement or cell counts. 
This is based on the turbidity or cloudiness of a tube or of a culture in a broth. Remember when you have a TSB broth? That TSB broth, if it's a sterile fresh media, is very clear. You can see right through it. It's an amber color. But after you've inoculated uh, that TSB broth with bacteria and, and incubated for a couple days, that broth becomes very turbid, very cloudy. And we can use this cloudiness as a indirect way of measuring cell numbers. Okay, so turbidity, the cloudiness of a, of a TSB sample is measured with a spectrophotometer. Okay, I'm going to show you a picture of that in a second. And then the measurement is referred to as the OD or optical density at a specified wavelength. Usually it's OD 600 or OD 540. For unicellular organisms, OD is proportional to the cell number within limits. Okay, so take a look here. You have your spectrophotometer and all your spectrophotometer is really essentially is a light bulb which then filters light of a particular wavelength. Remember, uh, if we want like uh, wavelength 600, then it got green light going through the sample. And all we're doing is measuring how much light makes it across our sample. So you would take your test tubes, you would place it in this machine, you would uh, set the wavelength to 600, and you would ask how much light made it across your sample, right? And whatever light was blocked by your sample is called your absorbance. So what you could see here is that, you know, it, with fresh, fresh broth, because you've calibrated your machine with fresh broth, your OD600 would be zero. So you would have uh, zero absorption at, at uh, you know, with fresh broth. Then you have this semi-turbid broth here, lightly turbid broth, and you would see your OD600 would go up to 0 0.18, for instance, which would give you 1.3 times 10 to the 8 cells. Then you have an even more turbid broth. This would give you 0.45, or 3.3 times 10 to the 8 cells per mil. And then you have 0.68. So you see, as the media becomes more and more turbid, it becomes more and more cloud cloudy, it's going to block more and more light. And as that OD value creeps up, you can, uh, you can calculate the number of cells uh, per ml that you have. Now, what's the benefit of this? Well, it's easy to do. Um, you could take multiple uh, measurements over time. So I could measure on day one. I could measure on day two. I could measure on day three and just let it grow in between. But what is a drawback of this method? I would say the main drawback is uh, if you have a cloudy medium like this, um, you're going to be counting both living and dead cells, right? You're going to be counting any cell that's floating around, whether it's alive or dead. So again, with the plate counts, you're only counting viable cells. But with the turbidimetric counts, you're counting viable and dead cells. All right, so let's move on to environmental effects on growth. Uh, specifically, let's start with temperature. Temperature is a major environmental factor controlling microbial growth. Remember, these microbes can't control their body temperatures like you and I can, so their external environment really affects their growth. And this is because they have metabolic enzymes inside of them and all their proteins, and enzymes work better and faster as temperature increases, but then at some point these enzymes denature and then the cell dies, right? And different enzymes and different cells, uh, they, they function better at different temperatures. And these are called the cardinal temperatures. There's the minimum temperature at which a cell can grow. There's the optimum temperature at which a cell grows. That would be when the cell grows the fastest. And then there's the maximum temperature at which a cell can grow. This would be the this would be the the threshold where a bacterial cell might die actually after experiencing that temperature. Usually, once you hit the maximum temperature, that causes denaturation of cellular proteins and enzymes and cell death. If you drop below the minimum threshold temperature, that doesn't usually cause cellular death, but it would cause freezing. So the cell would kind of freeze 
and not be able to grow. Again, you can see the minimum cardinal temperature, optimum, and maximum. At maximum, the cell dies. At minimum, the cell cannot grow. And between minimum and optimum, you have an increasing enzymatic reaction rate. So you've got better and better and better growth. Now, keep in mind, not all bacteria prefer room temperature or body temperature. There are bacteria that grow in cold. Uh, these are called the psychrophiles, which grow from 0 to 20 degrees C. The mesophiles, these are bacterium that grow from 20 degrees C to 45 degrees C. By the way, just to give you an idea, room temperature is about 24 degrees C. So um, room temperature is just above the mesophile standard for, for growing, their minimum growth uh, condition. And body temperature is 37 degrees C. So, so mesophiles prefer room temperature and body temperature. And would it surprise you at all to know that most of the bacteria that cause human conditions and human infections are indeed mesophiles. Mesophiles cause the human uh, diseases. They cause human diseases because they prefer to grow in the human body temperature range. Thermophiles are found in hot water, or, or sorry, hot environments, including hot water environments. These are 55 degrees to 85 degrees. And then you have the hyperthermophiles, which can be found anywhere from 85 degrees to 113 degrees C. So these are hot springs, deep sea, thermal, hydrothermal vents. Again, you can see psychrophiles, uh, their, their growth range, mesophiles, thermophiles, and hyperthermophiles. So how, how do these bacteria that grow in the cold, how have they adapted to grow in the cold? It's really interesting. The, their enzymes and proteins function optimally in the cold. They don't freeze because they have more alpha helices than beta sheets, which gives them a greater flexibility for cold temperatures. They also have more polar and fewer hydrophobic amino acids, which allows the molecules to remain fluid at cold temperatures. And they have fewer weak bonds in their proteins and enzymes, which allows them to, again, their proteins to be fluid at lower temperatures and prevent freezing. What does their cytoplasmic membrane look like? Well, their cytoplasmic membrane has a high level of unsaturated fatty acids. Unsaturated fatty acids remain fluid at colder temperatures. Um, they also have cold shock proteins. They have cryoprotectants. Uh, they can be, they have surface slime, this exopolysaccharide slime, which keeps them warm, uh, kind of like a miniature coat. Conversely, the thermophiles are optimized for growing in the heat. Okay. So how are these bacterium growing in the heat? They, well, they, they're, they're designed, they're proteins and enzymes fold best and function best in the heat. Uh, they, have, they have these uh, critical immune, amino acid substitutions with few, um, uh, in a few locations. And a lot of times you will see uh, cysteine residues. You remember cysteine amino acids? If two cysteine residues meet, they can form a covalent bond called a disulfide bridge. So you can form more disulfide bridges to prevent the protein from unfolding, the tertiary structure of the protein from unfolding. Keep in mind, here's what's going on. A protein, remember a protein is just a long string of amino acids that first form secondary structures like alpha helices and beta sheets. And then the protein needs to fold into a three-dimensional structure, right? That's called the properly folded protein. And proteins need to remain folded in order to work. Once you denature a protein, let's say by heating it too much, the protein will denature, it will unfold, right? Once a protein has denatured, it will not just renature. So you have to prevent denaturation of the proteins, especially these high temperature creatures, right? These high temperature archaea and bacteria that are literally living in these uh, 100 degree C temperatures, boiling temperatures, 
they need to stay intact. So how are they doing that? They have more ionic bonds between the basic and acidic uh, amino acid residues. They have a highly hydrophobic interior. They could produce solutes that help stabilize the proteins. So they have a number of tricks to staying together. They also modify, they have modifications in the plasma membrane to in ensure heat stability. For example, bacteria have lipids rich in long chain and saturated fatty acids. So yeah, you want saturated fatty acids, you want long chains, fewer unsaturated fatty acids so that the membrane stays together and doesn't break apart. All right, so before we move on actually to the next environmental effect, um, you know, pH, osmolarity, oxygen, and how they affect bacterial growth. Let's take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket so that we can come back strong uh, and finish off this chapter. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's continue on with chapter five with effects of pH on microbial growth. Just like how bacteria have a preference for temperature and there is no one temperature which is optimal for all bacteria, there's also no pH level which is optimal for all bacteria. Some bacteria prefer alkaline pH. This means higher pH, uh, above 7. Some bacterium prefer acidic pH. This means low pH, uh, below 7. And some bacterium prefer neutral pH. And there are terms for these. The bacterium that prefer acidic conditions, this means, you know, uh, down to 0 pH, up to a, about you know, up to seven. These are acidophiles. Those that prefer basic conditions are alkaliphiles or alkalinophiles. And those that prefer neutral pH are the neutrophiles. And again, you can find bacterium that prefer the whole gamut here. Um, <clears throat> so, if you were to imagine what kinds of microbes would cause human disease, what would you recommend? What would you think? Well, probably those that uh, like to grow in human conditions. Uh, the human physiological pH is about 7.4 to 7.9. Uh, this is uh, the pH uh, where most microbes that cause human disease live, and those would be neutrophiles. Okay, so E. coli, for instance, is a neutrophile. All right. Now, one thing that's really interesting about uh, these neutrophiles, uh, or I should say acidophiles versus um, alkalinophiles, is that they try to keep their internal conditions relatively close to neutral even though their external pH is highly acidic. So they could they could achieve this by uh, pumping protons out of the cell or synthesizing acid and heat shock proteins that protect proteins inside of the cell. They can change their pH of their habitat by producing acidic or basic waste products. So did you see what I'm saying? Even if a bacterium lives in a acidic pH, it'll still try to keep its internal conditions relatively close to neutral. Or if it lives in a basic uh, environment, it will still try to keep its uh, internal conditions relatively neutral by using certain tricks. Another important factor in the growth of microorganisms is called water availability. Water availability, or AW, uh, is also known as water uh, activity and can be expressed in physical terms defined as the ratio of vapor pressure in the air in equilibrium with a substance or solution to the vapor pressure of pure water. 
So pure water would have this ratio of one. So if you could think of pure water with an AW of one. And the more stuff you have mixed in with the water, the lower the value goes. So milk would have an AW of 0.97, saturated salt solution would have an AW of 0.75. You see, so the less water availability there is, the lower this ratio is. And the back bacteria that are osmotolerant include ones that can grow over a wide range of water avail availability or water activity. You can see here that um, some foods, including jams, jams, dried fruit, cereals, candies, these have a very low water availability. And a lot of bacterium require a relatively high water availability in order to grow. Otherwise, they actually get dehydrated. They lose uh, moisture and they can't grow. This is because it's a hypertonic environment to them. Water will, uh, you know, through osmosis, leave the cell. Um, this is why if you've ever noticed if you leave salami out or if you leave maple syrup out or jams out or, you know, candy out, dried food, fruit out, you know, it won't get spoiled by bacterium. And uh, that's because it has a relatively low water availability. And I, I haven't mentioned this earlier, but you can really look at these growth conditions with regard to temperature, pH, water availability, etc., and see how that plays a role in food storage. You know, we store our food in the free in the fridge or freezer. Well, the fridge is around four degrees C, well below what mesophiles prefer to grow, and it's the mesophiles that cause human disease. So you can see why we refrigerate or freeze our food because that's below the growth temperature of bacterium. Also with pH, you know, a lot of times we pickle things and pickling things, pickling uh, vegetables or pickling, the pickling process makes it acidic and, the, and bacterium don't like to grow in acidic conditions usually, especially not the ones that cause human disease. We also dry our foods we, or we salt our foods. You know, we, we use salt as a preservative or we dry foods as a preservative me uh, method and that's uh, a technique to lower the water availability. This prevents growth of bacterium on our food. So you can see by having a deep understanding of these, gro these growth conditions we've been talking about, you can see why we store our foods or preserve our foods in the way that we do. See, so typically the cytoplasm has a higher solute concentration than the surrounding environment. Thus, the tendency is for water to remove into the cell. When the cell is in an environment with a higher external solute concentration, for example, a low water availability uh, situation, water will flow out unless the cell has a mechanism to prevent this. This is why bacteria cannot grow in, uh, on jam or on cereal, with, which has a lower um, water availability. This is an example of a hypertonic situation, a hypertonic surrounding. In a hypertonic surrounding, water will leave the cell because the water concentration inside the cell is greater than the water concentration outside of the cell. So water leaves the cell, the membrane shrinks from the cell wall, and this process is known as plasmolysis. Bacteria don't mind hypotonic solutions. These are solutions where the water concentration is greater outside than inside because then water enters the cell and uh, most bacteria have a cell wall so the bacteria will not burst. But a hypertonic uh, solution, bacteria don't like this solution because water will leave the cell. Now there are some bacteria that can grow better at lower water availability. These are called halophiles. These are bacteria that grow best at uh, water availability of uh, less than one. Uh, this is seawater. They have a specific requirement for salt. And then there are halo-tolerant organisms. These are ones that can tolerate some additional dissolved solutes, but generally go best in the absence of solutes. And then there are the extreme halophiles. These are the ones that grow in places like the Dead Sea, where we have 15 to 30 percent salt they require very high levels of salt to grow. So you can see here, 
a typical bacterium like E. coli does not have a very uh, strong uh, ability to to grow in in salty conditions. You know, even even a uh, about 0.5 percent salt uh, to one percent salt is about what it can withstand. But uh, these uh, halo tolerant bacteria these halo tolerant bacterium can withstand up to 10 percent salt. Uh, an example is Staphylococcus aureus, and that makes sense because on your skin grows Staphylococcus aureus. Halophiles can grow up to 12% salt, and then the extreme halophiles can, you know, uh, they can they can actually tolerate more than 20% salt solution. Uh, and again, remember, um, I was telling you about bacterium that can cause human disease. They tend to be mesophiles. They tend to be neutrophiles. They tend to be, um, you know, it, the, look, at, look at your skin, for instance. Your skin is salty, right? And your sweat is salty. And have you ever noticed that it's staph infections that typically infect your skin? And most skin infections are staph infections, right? Um, so is it any wonder that staph Staphylococcus aureus, which is a very common bacterium that infects the skin, is a halo-tolerant bacterium. Um, staph prefers salty conditions. It, it enjoys a salty surroundings like your skin, so it can cause uh, skin disease, whereas uh, skin uh, infection, I should say. Whereas E. coli, which cannot stand strong, uh, you know, salty conditions. You know, this one would not be a typical skin resident. This would not grow well on your skin or cause be typical skin disease culprit. Uh, e. coli, on the other hand, prefers the inside of your gut. That's where it's optimal for its growth. Osmophiles, these are bacterium that live in environments high in sugar as a solute. Xerophiles grow in dry environments and about the lowest uh, water availability that is able to be uh, to to harbor life is about 0.61 water availability so how do bacterium reduce osmotic concentration of the cytoplasm in a hypotonic solution so this is a solution with more pure water outside uh, this pure water is forcing its way inside well, they could have mechanosensitive channels uh, in the plasma membrane to allow solutes to leave. If you allow solutes to leave, this will um, prevent as much osmosis uh, entering the cell, as much water entering the cell, because you're releasing some solutes. You can also increase the internal solute concentration with compatible solutes to increase the internal osmotic concentration for hypertonic solutions. So if you're in a hypertonic solution, such as uh, you know, you're on top of something with uh, low water availability, you're on top of cereal or jam or something like that, you can uh, fill, your, fill your internal uh, cytoplasm with compatible solutes this will allow you to lose less water, to retain more water. So next, let's talk about oxygen requirements with microbial growth. Uh, just like there are preferences with temperature, pH, salinity, etc., with bacterium, there's also a heavy preference for oxygen. Okay, there's oxygen-loving bacterium. There's bacterium that do not breathe oxygen. So let's get into that. Aerobes are bacterium uh, that require oxygen to grow. They grow in the presence of atmospheric oxygen. Don't forget that atmospheric oxygen contains about 20% oxygen. Anaerobes do not require oxygen and may actually even be killed by oxygen exposure. I'll explain how that works in a minute. Facultative organisms, facultative uh, anaerobes, for instance, can live with or without oxygen. Aerotolerant anaerobes are those that can tolerate oxygen and grow in it, but they don't really need it. They don't need oxygen, and they can't actually use oxygen. Microaerophiles are bacterium that can use oxygen, but only when it is present at reduced levels, such as 8 to 10 percent. Anaerobes cannot respire oxygen. 
aerotolerant anaerobes tolerate oxygen and grow in its presence even though they can't respire or use the oxygen. Obligate anaerobes, uh, also known as strict anaerobes, these are bacterium that are inhibited or even killed by oxygen. So here you can see different growth patterns for bacterium. If you have a uh, TSB tube, uh, you know, a broth tube, if you see bacteria simply growing right at the surface, that would be a strict aerophile, uh, aerobe, I should say, a strict aerobe bacterium. If you see bacteria only growing at the bottom, that would be a strict anaerobe. If you see bacterium growing throughout, but pre uh, with a preferential treatment for air, that would be a facultative bacterium. If you see bacterium but only growing underneath the surface, that would be a microaerophile. If you see bacteria with no preference, that would be aerotolerant bacterium. So why, why uh, did I say earlier that anaerobes can get killed by oxygen or inhibited by oxygen? Why is oxygen so dangerous? Well, oxygen uh, itself is not dangerous or toxic when it is in the form of molecular oxygen, O2. However, there are toxic byproducts of oxygen called single oxygen or singlet oxygen, superoxide anion, O2 minus, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, or hydroxyl radical, OH minus. These are called ROS reactive oxygen species and the problem with these is they are highly oxidative they can uh, they can strip electrons from DNA causing mutations or DNA damage they can strip electrons from proteins causing protein damage uh, cellular damage all kinds of cellular components can get disturbed and destroyed by uh, ROS right reactive oxygen species so Again, you can see that oxygen um, can form, uh, you know, all of these different Ross species, all of these different reactive oxygen species. So, like I said, oxygen is uh, not toxic to cells, but it, the reactive form of oxygen is. Now, there, life that can uh, persist in oxygen has... Uh, developed these enzymes. These enzymes uh, are an adaptation to neutralize most of the toxic oxygen species. For instance, organisms might have the, the enzymes catalase or peroxidase, which will convert hydrogen peroxide to oxygen and water. Superoxide dismutase enzyme converts uh, this uh, reactive oxygen species. This one would be, if I, I don't want to get it wrong, so, uh, superoxide anion. Superoxide anion to hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. And then obviously the, the peroxidase or catalase can then convert the hydrogen peroxide to oxygen. And superoxide reductase, which also converts this uh, anion to hydrogen peroxide without producing oxygen. But then again, uh, like I said, the hydrogen peroxide can then be uh, converted to molecular oxygen by catalase and peroxidase. So um, what I'm trying to get at is these organisms have adapted to, you know, uh, to, to express these, these genes for catalase, peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, superoxide, uh, superoxide reductase, and by, by expressing these genes and making these enzymes organisms have adapted to life in the presence of oxygen without being destroyed by the ROS, the reactive oxygen species. So those organisms that don't have these genes, that don't produce these uh, enzymes, cannot uh, grow in the presence of oxygen. In fact, oxygen uh, causes so much cellular damage that these bacterium die. So you see here, that's why all strict anaerobes, these are obligate anaerobes, lack or have very low quantities of superoxide dismutase and catalase. These are the enzymes, again, that help neutralize the reactive oxygen species. 
These microbes cannot tolerate oxygen and must be grown without oxygen. So now that we know how bacterium get their nutrition and how bacterium grow and some of their requirements for growth, let's talk about how we can control microbial growth. But before we do, let's, let's, let's uh, cover some terminology that's very important. Sterilization. What does that mean? That means killing or removal of all viable organisms within a growth medium. Okay, it's, it, it means all, including endospores. You know, when you sterilize, that is a powerful term. That means you have autoclaved the sample or flamed it with a fire, right? Or used an incinerator. Um, the sterilization is the gold standard for removing viable life, right? Uh, Disinfection, on the other hand, greatly uh, targets and removes pathogens, but not necessarily all microorganisms. So when you say you have disinfected something, that is to a lower standard than sterilization, which is the gold standard. And decontamination is even a lower standard. This is treatment of an object to make it safe to handle, but obviously not completely void of microorganisms. Heat sterilization is the most widely used method of controlling microbial growth. Um, heat, heat could be a dry heat, like an incinerator or fire, or more commonly in the healthcare profession, there's moist heat, uh, including the autoclave. So an autoclave is a sealed device that uses steam under pressure. Because you're building the pressure in, in an autoclave is, is essentially a overgrown uh, pressure cooker. When you build the pressure, you can raise the temperature above 100 degrees C. You can reach somewhere uh, approaching 121 degrees C. And this is strong enough, uh, hot enough to kill endospores and all other viable life. Uh, compare that to pasteurization, which you might have pasteurized milk, for instance, this is a process of using precisely controlled heat to reduce the microbial load in heat sensitive liquids. So for instance, you don't want to you don't want to autoclave milk or even boil milk because the proteins in the milk will denature and the milk will change taste. You know, the taste of the milk will change. So with pasteurization, you simply increase the temperature sub boiling. We're talking around 65, 78, 75 degrees C. Um, to kill most of the bacterium and then you cool it. This prevents uh, you know, the, the funny taste of boiled milk, but it also limits the number of bacteria, but by no means does this sterilize. So this is what an autoclave looks like. An autoclave is a base, essentially a pressure cooker. Um, you've got high pressure environment, which allows the steam, the moist heat to build to 121 degrees C, right? So you're building 121 degrees C for about 30 minutes or so, and that's enough to uh, kill the, the bacterium. And it is the temperature, not the pressure that kills the microbes. And when you're killing the microbes, by the way, uh, there's what's known as decimal reduction time. Decimal reduction time refers to the amount of time it takes to kill 90% of the bacterium. Uh, so at 50 degrees C, the decimal reduction time is 40 minutes, uh, 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 and this is a decimal reduction time of mesophiles. This is not, you know, endospores. At 50 degrees C, the decimal reduction time is 40 minutes. At 60 degrees C, you see it drops to about 12 or 13 minutes, and at 70 degrees C, it drops to less than five minutes. Um, so um, again, decimal reduction time means the number, the amount of time it takes to kill 90% or one log of an organism. All right, other physical control methods, radiation and filters. Let's talk about that. Microwaves, UV rays, X-rays, gamma rays, and electrons can all be used to limit microbial growth. UV has sufficient e energy to cause uh, modifications in DNA. Um, 
uh, if, you, if you've ever wondered how UV damages DNA, uh, also to you as a human being, if you go outside in the sun, the, the sun's UV can damage your skin. If you're a microorganism, the, the UV can damage the, de the DNA. If you've ever wondered how, uh, you know the sequence of genes, you've got A's, G's, C's, and T's in the genome. Well, if you have two pyrimidines, such as thymine and thymine in a row, or cytosine and cytosine right next to one another in the genome, UV can get absorbed by the DNA and cause the thymines to dimerize. So thymine-thymine becomes uh, a, a thymine-thymine bond. And cytosine and cytosine can bond to one another, forming a cytosine-cytosine bond. Um, uh, or dimer, thymine, thymine, dimer, cytosine, cytosine, dimer. And the problem with UV causing these adjacent pyrimidines to dimerize is that when the DNA is copied, that could lead to mutations, mis mistakes in the DNA copying. Okay, and this happens in humans as well as why DNA damage happens. And uh, this can lead to cell death uh, with uh, microorganisms. Ionizing radiation. So with ionizing radiation, you can d destroy bacterium by causing double-strand breaks in the bacterium. X-rays can cause double-strand breaks. Uh, radioactive nu nuclides can cause uh, da DNA damage as well and cell death. And by the way, um, a lot of times radiation is used for sterilization of uh, of of substances that are that are sensitive to heat and moisture. So, if you want to sterilize something like drugs, or if you want to sterilize something like uh, uh, plastic conical tubes, you could use radiation. Um, so you can see, you can use radiation uh, in order to to uh, sterilize drugs, fresh produce, meat plastic labware because think about it those are those are items that you would not want to put in an autoclave because an autoclave would ruin those products or you wouldn't want to you know uh, treat any other way with ionizing radiation you can bombard it with with this radiation that will destroy the microbes inside of the packet uh, and then that that's done with no heat applied or moisture applied and that's great so that's another standard by which you can treat and destroy microorganisms without destroying the product another way you can lower the number of microorganisms is by filtering uh, let's say you have a fluid you could filter the fluid and this avoids the use of heat on sensitive liquids and gases uh, you could filter it through very fine pores. These are nanopores, 0.2 micrometer pores, too small for living organisms. But they, the problem is a lot of times s smaller size viruses can get through the pores. So it's not perfect because it allows viruses through, but it is effective at preventing bacterium through. HEPA filters are an example too of fine filters that help pre uh, prevent, uh, you know, uh, and filter out microorganisms. Now a few more uh, a few more terms to know. Cidal agents like bactericide, fungicide, variside. Cidal agents kill, whereas static agents like bacteriostatic, fungistatic, varistatic, static agents inhibit the growth. Okay, just uh, some terminology to know there. All right. Here's some more terminology. The minimum inhibitory concentration uh, for a drug uh, or, or chemical, and this is known as the MIC, this is the smallest amount of an agent that is needed to inhibit the growth of a microorganism. All right, and again, we already touched on this, but let's do one more, one more time. Sterilins. This is sterilized, that's the gold standard. Sterilins are, are agents that destroy all microorganisms, including the endospores. Disinfectants, remember this is a lower standard, are used to kill uh, surfaces, used on surfaces to kill microorganisms, but not necessarily endospores. Sanitizers, this is an even lower standard, reduce microbial numbers, but do not sterilize. Antiseptics, 
These are agents that kill or inhibit microbe growth on the living tissues. They, they tend to be non-toxic enough to, to be applied to living tissues. Sanitation, this is an even lower standard. This is reduction of microbial populations to level deemed safe. Uh, for example, cleaning utensils at a restaurant. Antiseptics, antisepsis, uh, basically the same thing here. Uh, again, treating living tissue. Chemotherapy. Now, I want you to know that to a microbiologist, chemotherapy isn't just drugs to treat uh, cancer. Chemotherapy is the use of chemicals to kill or inhibit growth of microorganisms within the host tissue. So this includes um, antivirals, this includes um, antibiotics, or any other drugs you ingest to limit microbial growth inside of your, your system. Awesome. Well, that's it for this chapter. It's a really neat chapter. We touched on uh, how bacterium gather nutrients to grow, why those nutrients are important. We, d we touched on a little bit about how they grow and what's important in their growth and how to limit the growth and how to prevent the growth of bacterium. Very important chapter, especially for those of you going on to medical fields. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comment box below and I will catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.